Another question inspired by modern times is discussed now on BBC Radio 4 in The Moral Maze with Michael Burke. Good evening. It's ten years now since the Soviet Empire collapsed and the rigid structures of state socialism across Eastern Europe and much of Asia became, in retrospect almost overnight, the junk of history. It was hailed at the time as a triumph of the individual over the collective, an expression of a basic human desire for freedom. Travelling in East Germany and Russia at the time, it seemed to me more the triumph of the basic human desire for a car, a television and a washing machine, but reporters are like that. It was certainly held as a victory for democracy, a victory so final that history, at any rate history as a competition between ideologies, was over. Ten years on, there's still no competing political philosophy, but a chorus of concern that democracy in and of itself may not necessarily be the undiluted benefit everybody said it was. In Russia, a once popular, now palsied president rules by decree a country mired in corruption. Across the former Soviet bloc, the end of communism has brought inequality and uncertainty. Political freedom has not only failed to bring prosperity in most cases, but also justice, or even for many, an escape from authoritarian rule. The nomenclatura are still there, calling themselves capitalists now. Democracy is shallow. People are cynical about politics of any kind. Worse, the changes have unleashed ethnic hatreds in Yugoslavia, Tajikistan, the Caucasus. Elsewhere in the world, where democracy is said to have triumphed, there are similar worries that Western multi-party democracy in tribally divided African states can be a shortcut to violence. Above all, the last ten years have persuaded many people that our concept of liberal democracy is divisible, indeed may even sometimes be mutually exclusive. In Algeria, for instance, where the popular will is almost certainly in favour of highly illiberal Muslim fundamentalism. Democracy, after all, is merely a means for exercising personal freedom, choosing and changing a fair government that operates within the law. But is it necessarily the best way? Morally, as well as practically, is democracy always a good thing? Our moral maze, live this evening. Most of our regular panel, Janet Daly of the Daily Telegraph, Dr David Cook, the medical ethicist from Oxford, Professor Ian Hargreaves, the academic and commentator, and in place uh, of that great libertarian and democrat, Dr David Starkey, called to lower things tonight, Brian Micklethwaite from the Libertarian Alliance. Um, Ian Hargreaves. Well, I remember in 1989 I took a drive uh, through the Iron Curtain and queued up at the border of East Germany to get in, handed over my passport to a man with a gun and a peaked cap who took it away and put it on a little machine that uh, made it vanish in front of me and asked me for some money. And he pocketed the money and asked me for some more money. That was the pre-democratic system, one with no right of recourse or even right to speak. No political system is a guarantee against that kind of illiberalism, but government of the people, by the people, for the people, does locate the moral responsibility and rights of the citizen where they belong equally in every citizen. It can't be parachuted in like food aid, and it comes in all shapes and sizes. But I can't think of a country where, over time, democracy has made life worse for its citizens. Janet Daly. Well, Michael, I think the disaster that you described in the Soviet Union is more the aftermath of totalitarianism than the consequence of democracy. Um, I, I don't think you have to pretend that introducing the universal franchise <clears throat> is the complete answer to producing a free or a benign society. But it is the answer, as, I, as Ian said, to the fundamental question of how to give people the power to de decide who's going to govern them. Guaranteeing people the right to elect their own governments doesn't mean they'll use it wisely or justly or benevolently, but it does ensure that if they change their minds or their priorities or if if they feel betrayed or oppressed, they'll be able to remove those in power and replace them without violence. Democracy doesn't create an instant heaven on earth and it doesn't make politicians into saints, but it's the only system which allows people to grow and develop and to change their political leaders and their governments as they do so. Brian, Brian Micklesweight. Democracy is rather like sewage disposal. It's essential. It's by no means a precondition. It's a precondition for the good life, but it doesn't guarantee the good life and it can stink when you get really close to it. But, like all the speakers, uh, I'm anticipating David as well, uh, I'm in favour of it. And the best argument for democracy is the one Anne's just stated, that it, it is a better than civil war, and, the really subtle thing, it's often a persuasive substitute for civil war. The sort of people who would be killing each other in a real civil war can fight each other metaphorically in a democracy. David Cook, who hates to be taken for granted. Well, you go back to the cradle of democracy, which was Athens, and the Democrats there were only able to function because the women and the slaves, the helots, did all the work. Democracy can only work if there are structures, structures of freedom of the press, freedom of speech, the rule of law, and property rights because in the end the difficulty with all liberal democracy is human nature what are we going to do if people choose ignorance greed and racism 
Panel, thanks very much indeed. Our first witness is Dr Anita Prajmovska, who's a senior lecturer in international history at the London School of Economics. Uh, Anita, you, you grew up in um, in Poland, so you're, you're probably best placed to give us some idea of the, the price that Poles have paid for democracy and freedom and whether all Poles think that price was worth it. No, not all all Poles think so. I think what we have seen in Poland is a very dramatic change, not only in the economic structure, but in fact the social structure. And this is something that many Poles are starting to wonder about. Let me interrupt you and ask you, you grew up in Poland. Yes. So what were the, I mean, we tend to, you know, I, I suppose, uh, have looked at it at the time and, and, and look at it back at it uh, as a time of, of privation, of deprivation of liberty. Were the, were the positive things in society, post-war Polish communist society yes i think to to someone who has actually at the time i knew no other and what i had subsequently compared with for example what i had experienced as a child i can see that there were positive sides um for example there was incredible concentration on providing facilities for children on providing equality of access so children from poor backgrounds children from backgrounds which would normally not enjoy access to education to facilities for example cultural facilities um, recreational facilities facilities. This was actually provided for children. For people who were moving from villages into industry, there was an attempt made, not always successful, nevertheless, an attempt made to provide facilities like creches and nurses and schooling. Um, so there was genuinely an attempt made to build a new society. So I think to a child, it definitely was a time of hope and inspiration and incredible love and attention was showered on children. And I do remember that very strongly, that as a child I enjoyed that. Uh, David Cook, you're with Well, je dobre, as they say. <laughs> um, I, I'm interested in whether or not the move towards democracy in a country like Poland really was a political move or whether it was an economic move that had capitalism at the heart and core of it? Um, I think it's a complicated question. I don't think I can answer you in, in a straightforward way because the, 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 the reason I hesitate is because we always think that the dramatic change in Poland was in fact an attempt to overthrow communism and replace it with what we think freedom, which we equate immediately with democratic institutions and uh, uh, free market forces. Whereas in fact, if you look at the aspirations presented, program presented by the Solidarity Movement, it was a very mixed bag. I mean, there was a lot of points which would suggest that the workers were consciously and genuinely wanting, uh, seeking to defend the priorities um, and the, 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 the advantages that the communist system had given them. But For Solidarity it, wasn't left to its own devices. What no. happened was immediately the West, particularly American money, flooded in and capitalism came along. I don't think it's that clear. I, I myself feel that it's a, a picture of both the Poles wanting to assume control over their own economy, genuinely trying to get out of the economic morass. It's not just American money. It's the opening up of Poland to the capitalist system, which means that Polish capitalism is also very important. And did the important. Catholic Church help or hinder that process oh. of democratization? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, at the time of change, it was seen as as facilitating that change. I think subsequently, in other words now, I personally feel that the church has been left behind in that process. Do Poles now blame democracy in itself for uh, the uh, their dissatisfaction? Do you expect democracy to persist? I do expect democracy Sorry, to persist. Sorry, can you answer, <laughs> can you answer <laughs> my question? The, um, you can't speak of Poles as if they spoke with one voice. No, no, voice. no, but um, um, of course not. The Poles who have benefited, in other yes, words... Yes, 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 but the Poles who, that, are be, uh, that are basically disappointed, and uh, from what are, you were saying, there is a substantial portion of that. They are those who are bitterly disappointed. Do they blame democracy those, for that? Uh, yes. They do. Within the Solidarity Movement, there has been a lot of criticism that, in fact, the change, the round table talks, had resulted in capitalism coming in. And the latest demonstration, for example, the leaders of the peasant demonstrations, which have paralyzed Poland for some time, um, have said, OK, so co communism fell, but why did capitalism have to prevail? And that's a very telling phase. Janet Daly, your witness. You mentioned that in post war Poland there was a tremendous move toward equality of access, equality of opportunity, and so on. There was in Britain as well. Um, and Britain was a democracy and was still basically capitalist, although it deviated a bit after the war. Um, that, was a, that was a general feeling in the European societies after the war, wasn't it? It wasn't particularly to do with certain kinds of political... I think you structure. have to differentiate between the poorer, backward countries, which would not have had facilities to put in mm. place something like the welfare state, and the communist system, which in fact had consciously decided to invest into particular aspects of society, neglecting others. We're mm. talking about communism in which there was a determination to actually finance 
and subsidise yes. certain industries I mean, you're for talking, social reasons. You're talking about a command economy. Yes. And that has been the real change in Poland, hasn't it? Away from a command economy. Yes, I think that I agree with that one, but I think at least in the initial post-war period there was an attempt to build a new type of society also. Now oh, we yes. know that that it was... It was command economy combined with social engineering, but there wasn't there also a feeling when, when Poland uh, sort of escaped from, from communism, it was also escaping from what it saw as the sort of colonialism by Soviet Russia. That was what the Poles ultimately interpreted, but I think on, on, on reassessment it has been realised that Soviet control has not always meant actually total exploitation. It was a very mixed picture. D Dr. Ian Hargreaves? Dr. Przewodniczący, could, uh, could you tell me whether you think that the democracy that now exists in Poland can or should be in any sense reversed or mitigated? No, I don't think so. I think democracy has actually taken root in Poland. It's very healthy. It's very durable. There is no reversing of this process. So the dissatisfaction that exists with it is, in your view, misguided? No, I don't think so. I think that it is within certain aspects or certain sections of the community and in, to that community there has been a genuine and real loss of um, the S privileges so, so, and security so, they enjoyed before. So what should other democratic politicians, what should the other Poles do about that? Well, there is a very similar debate taking place in Poland as there had been in Britain at the time of the closing of mines and steelworks, exactly. which is a demand that there should be a more sensitive approach towards workers who have suffered for so, no reason so, of so their own. So a fairer own. form of democracy, yes. a fairer yeah, economic settlement. Brian Within Michael the democratic... Um, uh, Yes, system, rather yes. than as a challenge to the whole idea of democracy. Two things. One, we have genuinely parliamentary uh, uh, debates, which genuinely and openly discussing things. But there are those who feel that the parliament is not listening to them. And we can see that in the solidarity movement and the peasant strikes, which are, as I mentioned already, very important in Poland. These are people who believe that parliamentary democracy actually is not uh, uh, heeding their demands for a more sensitive handling of their grievances. But isn't the practical cool? problem for the Democrats in Poland that the hospital service, for example, has collapsed? And yes. what was an excellent hospital service is now in ruins because there isn't the finance and the support for yes. it. It's not just the hospital service, but schooling, for example, has collapsed. I think there has been a sort of a rush towards free market forces, which has left behind not only the achievements of the communist system, but it put nothing in its place yet. Janet Dating? That's part of the trouble with totalitarianism. Minute. It leaves a vacuum in its wake. But I, I was interested in your point I wouldn't about necessarily agree with that one. I would say uh, that one has to also consider aspects of the transitional period. Yes. It's not just the failures of totalitarianism, but the failures of the transitionary period, right. which is conducted... I, <clears throat> I, was, I was interested in your point when you said that, that, that however, whatever the failures, whatever the c consequences, democracy is now firmly entrenched. I mean, yes. do you think that democracy inoculates people against totalitarianism? Once well, I don't think we could consider that to be the issue in Poland because the Poles genuinely did never did believe that communism was appropriate a mm. political system for them so I don't think that the Poles were ever uh, convinced by uh, communism it's that presently they've got the freedom to themselves impose what they want uh, and I suppose a, a central moral question in all this are the Poles who look at it and say democracy must necessarily be the pursuit of individual self-interest and I as such uh, feel it is not uh, not only is it yes. not the only way but it's not the best way. The poll, there is a lot of talk presently in the media about criminality and the quite clearly uh, child psychologists and uh, 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 police are commenting upon the fact that we are for the first time facing s whole sections within the community which is marginalised and what we see is criminality. And this is something that they lament, the loss of that purposefulness and social values. Dr. Prashmovsky, uh, Dr. Prashmovsky, thanks very much indeed. Right, our next witness is uh, is uh, Ken Livingstone, the Labour MP, of course, and contender for the uh, mayor of mayor of London, indeed. And uh, Ken's been uh, unable to to get here tonight, so we've we've nabbed him uh, on the phone. Ken, bearing in mind what's happened over the last ten years, um, is democracy the only way? I think it is. What struck me, I've been to back to Russia, virtually every year or so since the fall of Gorbachev. And people are bitterly unhappy about a lot of the economic reforms and the poverty, but they're pretty determined to hang on to their democratic rights. And you have these, I mean, it always seems to be a, pre a parliamentary election in the middle of winter, but it still gets a very good turnout. Um, so I, I think people would desperately um, resist any attempt to go back to dictatorship. But I think that, that they, would, they would put up with some pretty huge changes in the economic policies. Okay, Janet Daly, your witness. 
so um, let me get this right then. You, you approve of democracy, but you don't like um, economic liberalism. You don't like the capitalism that seems to go with it in the Soviet Union. Well, when you talk to Yeltsin's people, they, they've got this excuse, which is this how, is how capitalism begins. It's very corrupt and very destructive. Um, and I just don't think that's, that's a justification that's acceptable. I mean, this isn't capitalism. It's very disfigured. I mean, 90% of economic activity in, in Russia is linked to um, organized crime in one way or another. And the privatization was a farce. A lot of people got very rich. The vast mass of the population got nothing out of it. Where you look at, say, it's been better handled, like the Czech Republic or Poland um, or Hungary, um, those economic reforms I mean, they have been painful, but then they're, they're not the sort of vast criminal conspiracy that um, Yeltsin's Russia seems to become. And is that the fault of the, is that the fault of the democratic process in Russia, or what? I think a lot of it is the fault uh, of the West. We advise them to just basically take Thatcherite type neoliberal policies, leave it to the market, and the transition from an economy which had everything planned by the state could not just happen. This idea of shock therapy has been a disaster. I mean, the average man's lifespan has slumped to 58 years from about 70 because there's very little work and people are drinking themselves to death. Uh, so if, 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 a Demo if an electorate, given the universal franchise, were to choose capitalist, a capitalist economy in, out of a democratic, legitimate democratic process, would you disapprove of that or would oh, you... No, you see, I just don't think this really is. I mean, what we, this would be the capitalism we had in Britain under Walpole over 200 years ago, riddled with corruption, and it took the British state 100 years of reform to, to get rid of that, that, that corruption. Well, you, the Russian people can't wait 100 years. No, well, how do you propose that the democratic institutions in Russia deal with that, then? Well, part of the problem is that, I mean, the, if you looked at the last presidential election, which Yeltsin beat the communist contender, the, the coverage was incredibly slanted. I mean, it was about 98% of television coverage was pro-Yeltsin. And there's no way that that, that that will carry on indefinitely. I mean, you, you run the risk, therefore, that people might talk in terms of coups or the military might step in. It's a bit it, like the media new Labour here, then. <laughs> no, nothing like as, nothing like as good as that. Uh, 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 low blow. Uh, Ian Hargreaves? Uh, Ken, speaking of new Labour, how satisfied are you with the quality of democracy in the Labour Party today? Oh, I think we're having some temporary problems. I mean, I can understand how a lot of people think that if we have any honest debate, it can be blown up by the media's great splits. And I, if you remember when Harold Wilson got in 30 years ago, everyone complained he tried to control everything. He wouldn't delegate and he interfered. In his second term, he was much more relaxed and devolved. And for a party that's been out of office for 18 years and for a government in which most people haven't any previous government experience, it's not surprising that there's a tendency to try and control everything. Is it a moral issue for it to become more democratic, the workings of the party? I think it is. I mean, the, 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 the problem you've got in Russia is that the democracy is... is we could do with more democracy. And you could do a bit more democracy inside the Labour Party at the moment as well. But if we do have David uh, more democracy, what happens if people democratically choose racism, democratically choose nationalism, democratically choose greed? Well, I think that th that is the risk in Russia, that um, anti-Semitism um, will start to rear its head again because people say, well, the banks are all run by Jews and unprincipled politicians will capitalise But on isn't that. that all right if it's democracy? No, isn't it isn't it? all right, because, I mean, the, the sort of people who ride that wave to power are, the, 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 then as soon as they get there, destroy democracy. In that sort of circumstance, all the democratic forces have to rally together, as they did in France, when Le Pen suddenly shocked the French system by getting 15% of the vote. All the other parties then turned on and exposed Le Pen for the sort of crypto-fascist that he was. Brian Micklethwaite, the last well, question. The interesting thing is that you've described the conditions in Russia as been so depressing, and yet there doesn't seem to be any willingness to blame democracy itself for these problems and that that confirms what a what a very resilient system democracy is is that right oh yes it is i mean the people are, i mean i'm i'm in, amazed at how enthused they are and how frequently they vote and in often in very difficult conditions i think part of the problem is that we made the mistake of backing giving yeltsin a blank check and yeltsin has some very undemocratic instincts i was in the white house just the the before Yeltsin suspended the Constitution. 
And there's all this talk here in the West, and John Major and, and George Bush echoed it, that the, these people in the White House were all communists and there was a threat to, to bring back the old system. But I was with the Speaker of the Parliament, Hasbalatov. He was to the right of me. He was about where Brian Gould used to be on the spectrum. He was a <laughs> bit of a tribunite. And we went along It's not difficult that. to be the, to the right of you, though, is it, Ken, to be <laughs> No, OK, no, we'll, we'll, have, we'll, we'll, we'll have to stop you there, Ken. Uh, thanks, th th much. Th thanks Thanks ever so much. Cheers. Our next witness is, um, is Adrian Karadnici, who's uh, president of Freedom House, which is an American uh, think tank. Mr. Karadnici, uh, I gather your view, uh, as I understand it, is that this criticism or scepticism of democracy uh, over the ten years since the fall of the Berlin Wall is, is being rather overdone. Well, I think it is being overdone, and it's a kind of a global. There is a global trend, which is to say, in the last ten years, we've seen a proliferation of democratically elected regimes, and very early on, they have rather weak rule of law, and rather weak civil institutions. But with time and through repetitive and competitive elections, they seem to perfect their institutions, and you see a more robust civil society, a more robust media following on, and usually they try to settle their economic problems in some uh, reasonably uh, equitable and productive manner. So. so the global expansion of democracy has uh, contributed to a better world in the last decade. For so, sure. in your view, we're not witnessing the failure of democracy in, in some of these countries, but the uh, nursery slopes. Well, there are always tough cases. You know, Weimar, <laughs> Weimar Germany is a tough case, or Hitler's democratic election, the Algerian crisis. But in the main, this is the way that uh, uh, both uh, prosperity and uh, uh, individual freedom have been advanced over the last uh, quarter century. Ian Hargreaves, your witness. Successive American and British governments have made democratic governance a condition of aid and uh, loans, for example. Do you think the West does stand accused, for example, in Russia, of selling a one-size-fits-all democracy and capitalism? Well, I don't think that democracy can be constructed. In the places where this, this external pressure has worked best, there are internal democratic forces that are pressing from within for change. And I think this kind of aid is not as structured. I mean, the United States has provided aid in Indonesia. It's provided aid in all sorts. It's provided aid to Kazakhstan and to Uzbekistan, hardly uh, uh, paragons of democratic practice. So I don't think that this policy is enforced as rigorously as your question suggests. But in the main, there is this kind of pressure. And in the main, it has... Uh, helped protect the space that uh, individual democratic activists and civic society has carved out for itself. But why has it been accompanied by so much banditry, cronyism, greed, and uh, collapse of very important social infrastructures? Well, I think that we've been dealing with, in the post-communist world, with several revolutions. Of the 28 uh, post-communist states, only six of them exist in the borders which they had 10 years ago. So you're talking about national revolutions, you're talking about uh, political revolutions, and you're talking about very fundamental economic revolutions. The complexity of all these issues, it's hardly right to saddle democratic procedures and democratic practices with the onus for these other uh, rather uh, uh, difficult tasks. So we, we stick with promoting democracy through thick and thin. When we get in Algeria, what are we supposed to do where the people uh, vote for Islamic fundamentalism? Well, it's often in the case that you actually can promote it through thin, and you needn't always do it through thick. There are certain circumstances where society is so deeply divided that premature elections and the premature pressure towards elections... So what's your position uh, on Algeria? What, would, would you have honoured the Algerian elections? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, a reasonable uh, suspension, I, th I think, I mean, I'm not an advocate of it, but what happened, I think, was preferable uh, to this Islamist power coming, Islamist force So you draw the line there, you would, you would resist democracy in that case? I think that there are some cases where reasonable people would see that there is a grave threat to liberty and that, uh, you know, the postponing of democratic procedures is not necessarily uh, uh, an end to democratic possibility in the future. Brian Micklesweight. But what do you, pressing you on Algeria, because that seems to be the hardest case, in, in general I'm in, in agreement with what you've said, but do you, supposing that the um, Islamic party had prevailed and that the result was allowed to stand, what do you think would then have happened? Um, I think that we might have seen the construction of an uh, Islamist uh, uh, state with uh, the introduction of Sharia, the suspension of civil liberties, a kind of a bloody vengeance against the old, more secular order, and uh, you know, a further momentum in the uh, Islamic world, particularly in the uh, in in the uh, in sort of the Middle East region and in North Africa, of these kinds of uh, so, uh, political. So phenomena. Islam is the great exception, then, is it? it, you, it the, the magic of dem you describe the way that democracy causes other things to 
get better, the media to become more robust and so forth, and the, the institutions to become more entrenched in, in the former Certain, Soviet empire, but not yeah. in Islamic world. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's not exactly the, the case. I mean, there are Islamic democracies. Mali, which is not a very robust democracy, but nevertheless is a democracy, is a case, in, for example. We have Indonesia, where there are now bubbling democratic trends, even within the context of it being the world's most populous Islamic uh, country. Uh, so it seems to me that I don't think Islam uh, is, uh, is uh, somehow inevitably predisposed. And in Iran, we see some manifestations of uh, Can I take the you yearning away for from participation. Iran mm -hmm. and, and Algeria and Islam to uh, that uh, center of capitalism, the United States. Can you explain to me how the democratic process of electing judges to the Supreme Court and how small states have the same number of Senate representatives as large states, how democratic is that? Well, it's uh, it's liberal. It's not democratic. That is to say, that it is a system of checks and balances in which the rights of certain constructed minorities. Right. So, uh, are you really talking about statement. democracy, or are you talking about liberalism then? Well, we're talking about both. It seems to me that. Uh, the democracy comes in the regular expression of the popular will to change governments, to make adjustments in how uh, one is governed and in how one's laws are shaped. And but you're saying not a very liberal view, because if they wanted democratically to choose a totalitarian state, then that's not allowed. But if they choose a liberal one, that is allowed. Uh, well, it, it's, uh, you know, there are all sorts of constitutional structures that societies uh, can embed in terms of particular behavior, and uh, you don't have, uh, you know, ex ex regime changes democratically don't all occur at one time. Uh, you have uh, a legal system which uh, moves at its own pace and appointments that are not in exactly concurrent with uh, uh, the rule of democratically uh, elected leaders, and so you can sustain, it seems to me, uh, some uh, protections against the enemies of democracy who may take power but through Democratic Excuse means. me, aren't, aren't, you, aren't you defining as the enemy of democracy anything that doesn't subscribe to your particular liberal values uh, about an independent judiciary and a secular state? Um, does every, do we have to buy all that? I mean, what if the population votes for its own particular religious culture? Well, I think that uh, there are all sorts of protections uh, that a society can construct and has constructed. And in general, you will find that open societies and democratic societies, uh, which more or less are beginning to become uh, identical, uh, tend to construct protections for minorities and the like. And so these kinds of religious impulses and uh, atavistic impulses are, oh. are more constrained by the rule of law Sorry, system. Sorry, hang on. Construct. Are you using the word religious and atavistic as if they were synonymous? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm using them as two separate but uh, passionately and deeply held uh, uh, factors right. in human but, life. Right, but the secular state is your ideal, isn't it? I mean, let's be frank about this. That, that's well, you know, there's a, you know, I think that a, a state in which uh, religion has a, an influence over the culture and exerts that influence indirectly is preferred to, the, to, to, religious, uh, to religion using all of its natural uh, moral advantages in the, political, uh, in, the, in, the, in the political sphere and in the sphere of contested politics. It certainly is preferable... Uh, to, uh, that religion not be as active in that, uh, given all the advantages, moral advantages that it has. Adrian Kalanichi, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Our last witness is Barry Shane, who's Professor of Political Theory at Colgate University, which is New York State? In New York State. Uh, if, as um, recent history seems to be telling us, democracy in itself is not enough, what's missing? Why isn't it working? In, think, in some of these countries, at least. I think the, what history bears or, or shows us is that there needs to be an institutional matrix within which democracy exists. Uh, 19th century America had a set of institutions which were copied by most South American regimes, and yet with very different results. The institutional framing itself depends on what's now being called civil society, which was frequently in the past called intermediate institutions. Many of these are illiberal, many are Ill undemocratic, but it's these... Uh, substrate, this matrix within which demo democratic institutions can find themselves, which I think helps ensure, or ensure is too strong, helps uh, um, at least uh, give you a better opportunity for success. Uh, the optimists would say that these fledgling democracies, democracy there is creating creating the conditions, if you'd like. It's, it's, it's a step, the nursery slips, as I was saying before, uh, of a just and prosperous society. Well, Are I, you an optimist in, the, in, that, in that context? No. I mean, what, what it's produced is a growth industry in the United States of sending over experts on civil society to go over to Eastern Bloc countries to tell them how to create what they don't know how to create. It's not something we have a, a real keen or understanding of is how actually to produce the plants, which are in fact the substrate for democratic institutions,
um, to be successful. I mean, America is, is a remarkably successful, and it mostly works because it's not very democratic. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Micklesworth. Professor Shane, can I press you on definitions? When you say democracy, do you just mean the paraphernalia of voting elections, manifestos, and then parliaments and laws, or do you mean something more elusive and civilised and, and decent? I distinguish liberalism and democracy because I don't find them to D be... Democracy just means the voting procedures, does it? it it's it, one particular institutional arrangement, yes. Yeah. Liberalism is something quite different. Mm. Uh, Algiers, in my instance, is, is a de when it was successful in, in electing people which are illiberal, if you're a Democrat, you go with the electorate. Um, how many countries, you, you surely know this better than I do, how many countries have actually ceased to be democratic in the last ten years? Have ceased to be democratic? Ceased to be gone from democracies to despotisms or dictatorships or monarchies or something like that. I don't know. You got me. Jolly few, I'm guessing. I can't think of so any. So in other words, can. in terms of actually persisting, democracy seems to perpetuate itself. Maybe it doesn't do other nice things, but it, 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 it's here to stay, isn't it? Well, I mean, if we were talking 1900 what, and we were talking 1940, do you think our conversations would be the same? In 1900, the, the expect, expectation would be that, of course, we've all, we solved all these problems. In 1940, the expectation would be we failed at all the problems. Um, it's a little premature to talk about the end of history. Um, we have a, at best a 200-year experiment, in many places a 20-year experiment, and I think that in many ways individualism is eroding the, the moral foundations which would make successful our ability to resist economic dislocation. Well, of course, I flatly disagree with that. I'm in favour of individualism, and I think it helps the formation of moral capital, as it's called. But going back to this thing about the, the, the changing enthusiasm for democracy, couldn't you turn that around and say that after a long struggle, the 20th century has arrived at a, at a consensus reflected at this table that democracy is a fine thing? And, and that means we can expect it to... Americans' elite don't like democracy. They like the appearance of democracy. Ian Hargreaves. Can I put the Algeria question to you? W uh, what do you think, what attitude should the West have taken to a vote by the people of Algeria to elect an Islamic? It's a question, are they generally Democrats or not? And but what's your view? Well, given the distinctions that you are making between democracy I'm and the I'm a Democrat. I would have voted with, the, I would have supported the, the elected government. But it means, again, my point, I don't think that most Western elites are Democrats. They're liberals. And they they are willing to support democracy as long as it doesn't erode what they take to be far more important, which is the rights of individuals. So how do you then weigh the two moral positions that lie behind that? Why is one, in your judgment, morally uh, to take precedence over the other, the principle of democracy over the principle of liberalism? What gives it its moral superiority? It has to do with, uh, at the bottom line, with different visions of, of, of human beings and their nature. Um, liberals generally view that people are self-directing as individuals, and Democrats think that they're s capable of self-direction, but as a corporate body. Can you give me Can an I example? Can you give me an example of a liberal society that isn't democratic? Of a liberal so England in the 19th century. Or in the 18th century. Oh, no, no. It was no, patchily uh, democratic, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, it's only, only patchily <coughs> liberal, too. Uh, but, I mean, but I'm talking about the 20th century and present conditions. Are there any societies that are not democratic, that don't have democratic institutions, but which fulfill your criteria for being liberal? Probably not. Right, so what do you conclude from that? I conclude today that to be to be liberal gives you need the appearance of being democratic. No, I'm sorry, I'm I'm talking about societies that are genuinely democratic. I don't understand your mystical distinction between appearing democratic and being democratic. Me. Particularly not in the case of the United States. But what what so are you agreeing with me then that democracy is a necessary but not necessarily a sufficient condition for being liberal? America is a system designed to give the appearance of one thing in the reality of another. America is, is a country where most important decisions are, are frequently adjudicated through a court which is anything but democratic. The, the willingness or capacity for people for self-rule is something which is frightening to most but American elites. Some people would argue that the independence of the judiciary, which is to say the political independence of the ju judiciary, is necessary for a liberal society. You seem to be implying... We well, so you, But you seem but to be implying... not a democratic society. So they're antithetical, then, being liberal and democratic? Maybe antithetical is too strong, but certainly in great tension.
Can I tease out a, a slightly David different Cook? aspect? Because I'm interested in what you had to say about human nature. And it, it seemed that the democracy and the liberal views always rest on a kind of optimism, either about the individual or the community. What happens if you're pessimistic, or as I would say, realistic about human nature, that people make bad choices? Well, America was, the earliest democracies in America were based on a Calvinist understanding of human nature. And it wasn't because they were Total wanted... depravity, then. Yeah, well, but the understanding is that that was part of what caused them to differ with their English uh, cohorts who had confidence in the king. Mr. The, Clinton is different now. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Clinton is many things. <laughs> uh, Let us not get sidetracked. Sorry. But, I mean, the initial democratic mo movement in America was not an optimistic one. It was based on an equality of human sin. And that this is what caused them to be distrustful of long chains of hierarchy. And so you need to some way of controlling democracy then? and controlling the choices that people make? Well, no, their interest was in controlling elites. I mean, controlling uh, elites that were not part of a, a, a body, a mediation, where, I mean, the thing that was distinct about the king was the king was above all other political, uh, if you will, he wasn't part of a matrix. He stood outside of it, and that's what caused him to distrust them. But no the, king is above the law, though. <laughs> and, a moot point and, and, and another sidetrack. In yeah, aren't you just defining democracy in too narrow a fashion? Uh, surely a body like the Supreme Court, or for that matter, the Council of the Bundesbank, can have democratic, uh, democratic legitimacy without it being one person, one vote to elect the body. In Christopher Lash and other in America have written about, wrote about this and took it uh, very seriously. There's a, there's a movement on the left that finds the Supreme Court and its capacity to vacate uh, democratically elected legislation to be something which is highly antithetical to democracy. Very Shane, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, let, let continue this rather uh, this critique of de of democracy. Uh, should we start with the Algerian question, uh, uh, Janet? Uh, where do you stand well, on that? Uh, if you're a, if you're a strict democrat, the people choose, and it is their right to choose. And I'm a bit worried about David Cook's having these caveats about if they choose the wrong things, if they things that, if they choose things that he disapproves of, then that's somehow inherently sinister. What do you it mean, Adrian Karanichi's point of yeah, democracy right. up to a point? Yes, yeah. I mean, it, you know, I, I, ultimately the question has to be is it worth it to be free even if that means that you're less safe or less virtuous I and I think ultimately that ha the yes has to be the answer to that. Adrian, Adrian Carradine as Huggins. well sounded too much to me like somebody whose think tank is projecting a view of American interests as opposed to uh, some worked through set of moral principles. And he was totally illiberal that was the nonsense that in the name of alleged liberalism he was liberal only if it was exactly like us but if it was Islam or if religion played too strong a role then it had to be controlled. Brian Micklethwaite, as a libertarian, well, we, I, suppose, I the moral, suppose we know where you're coming well, from on, on the Algerian uh, question. Not necessarily. I mean, it seems to me an interesting, interesting question. Supposing they'd been allowed to go ahead with their, presumably to begin with, fundamentalist government, what then would have happened? Would, would, they, have, um, would they have softened into something more genuinely liberal? Um, and would it have been uh, worse than it is, is, is that not approximately what's beginning? And how long would it be worth to wait? Exactly. I mean, it seems to me that the moral way of judging all these matters has to include consequentialism. It has to include a view of the future, of, what, of how these institutions are going to work out in the future. But, it can't just be um, a philosophical but, but judgment made right now. But isn't the, the very basis of democracy that we entrust to each other the power to make decisions? And the idea that, uh, you know, a think tank in Washington or even a government in Washington is going to second guess uh, the judgments of people all around the world is actually preposterous. Well, well, Janet, did, uh, Janet did, did you have any sympathy for Dr. Pravzhmovska? I made it that time. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, her, her nostalgia for it was more than nostalgia. There was a worked out argument that there yeah. were things that had been left behind. There were, there were characteristics of the, uh, of the totalitarian socialist state uh, which cannot be reproduced in, 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 by democracy and, yeah. and are valuable well, and are I don't, lost. I don't, know if they, I don't know if they cannot be produced. I wouldn't say they cannot be reproduced by democracy. Well, it's a lot be, easier. Aren't, aren't being, yeah, anyway. At the moment, I mean, mm. it's a lot easier to, do, to be a, an effective social engineer when you're a totalitarian. It's much easier. Democracy is very awkward in that respect. But 
But I think we, we, we in Europe, not only Americans, but we in Europe have to come to terms with the possibility that liberal democracy, as we understand it, is essentially a Western European phenomenon. Um, it, it comes from the Protestant tradition, it comes from the Enlightenment, and it may not be universalizable. It, other people's democracies may look very different, and they may include Islamic fundamentalism. That's a very important point, yeah, and because... part of that is the nature of democracy presupposes some no no notion of community. And to have a community, there has to be some set of common values. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about Poland or Romania is that there were common values. The difficulty was that when communism fell, we put nothing in its place. So there's been it's no not up institutional. To us to put in its place. Well, uh, well, it's up to those populations. But the to difficulty come to is terms, what we but... did was we rushed in with a form of capitalism, which didn't encourage the local communities to develop a democracy which was appropriate well, to their context, to the community, though, to their culture. I think, I think mm -hmm. David's just put his finger on one of the weaknesses of democracy, which is when it isn't clear that a group of people regard themselves as, as it were, fellow citizens, part of the same community, that's when democracy is, is at its most weak and volatile. But it's noticeable that in Britain, we've been talking as if we're the world masters of this subject and that what we do always works. In Northern Ireland, we, we've had our problems, haven't we? And that's the sort of reason why. Yes, and the problem in Poland is not uh, a problem, uh, as indeed uh, our guest said, of commitment to democracy. It's a problem of an economic crisis and the collapse of a social infrastructure, mm. which can be rebuilt. But Brian touched there on, the, on one of the difficulties of democracy that we haven't really majored on here, and that's the potential uh, dictatorship of the majority. Yes, I mean, the moral case against democracy is that eight people beating up two people mm. or robbing them or killing them is not excusable mm. merely because you could pass it mm. off as what, democratic. What about Barry Shane's uh, point, which I'm paraphrasing, but I hope I've got right, that, 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 that he sees a pattern in which individualism is eroding the, the moral basis of democracy? I find, that, I, I find that very difficult. Um, you bared your teeth. Then, Indi Jenny. Yeah, I find it very difficult because I th that always seems to me to be the argument of collectivists. Um, uh, the, the individualism is dangerous, it's true, and it leads to instability, but it is a necessary condition for freedom on some level. And these things have to operate in balance with each other, which is what uh, advanced, developed democratic systems are about. Uh, Barry Shane didn't really have anything to say about what he wanted to see change in the form of American democracy, although, in principle, he was fundamentally critical of it. David Cook, you, you haven't really waxed very long on, on religion and how uh, religion and, uh, and, <laughs> and democracy to be invited into so link. To do. Can, uh, can, you, can you do so in about 15 seconds? I think it's very important that religion can help because it provides a basis of common values. It also provides a motivation. And I think what's interesting in the Polish scene is the way in which the Catholic Church actually provided a focus for the development of democracy and genuinely liberal values encouraging freedom, not just for the individual, but for the whole community. David, it's not thought for today, but that was very good. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, to our panel, Janet Daly, David Cook, Ian Hargreaves, uh, and from Brian Micklethwaite, and from me. Till the same time next week. Bye-bye. The Moral Maze was presented by Michael Burke and produced by David Coombs. Now, on BBC Radio 4, Will Self presents the fourth in our series of Lent Talks, in which writers with a variety of religious beliefs offer their personal reflections on the meaning of Easter. As an agnostic, I'm not at all sure that I should be saying anything at all about the Christian festival of Easter. We are living through paradoxical times as far as religious beliefs are concerned. Indeed, when it comes to considering Easter, I find myself screwed to the sticking point of what my agnosticism actually means. It's all very well hiding behind I don't know when it comes to the large-scale metaphysical underpinnings of religion. Does God exist? I don't know. What happens when we die? I don't know. Are we brought into this world for a transcendent purpose? Once again, I don't know. However, at the level of everyday ethical decisions, should the whereabouts of sex offenders be made known publicly, should government seek to influence the nature of the family, such I don't knows really do become offensive to the properly religious of all stripes. When you're lost in the rain and worries and it's Easter time too, and your gravity fails, negativity don't pull you through. Bob Dylan a.k.a. Robert Zimmerman, the secular Jew turned fundamentalist Christian turned orthodox Jew, whose Zen grappling with religion and religiosity lies as near to the core of the poetics of the post-bomb 20th century as any other body of literature, speaks for me in this cold, 
awful vernal equinox as he voices for us all the unnaturalness of the rest of the emotional year. I've never seen spring turn so quickly into autumn. I hate Easter time, and by extension, I hate Easter. Not that I really know anything of Easter itself at all. There's a Venn intersection between Radio 4, the laity of the Church of England, and the rest of what laughably calls itself the fourth estate in this country, which means that the rituals of the organised and semi-state-sanctioned religions receive a vastly disproportionate amount of consideration. <laughs> 